All right, all right, all right. Well, good morning, Docs at Church. I love that sound so much. Could keep going for a really long time. Y'all can go ahead and take a seat. We're going to keep on with our series this morning in the book of Daniel. Um, if we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Rudy Hartman. I get to serve on staff here at Docs at Church, primarily with our college ministry, the Salt Company. Um, really grateful to get to be here to open up the text with you as we move into Daniel chapter 9. If you've got a Bible, Daniel, chap- Daniel chapter 9. I'll have a, a good chunk of it on the screen behind me this morning. I'm going to show you my work. Um, but I want to catch you up real quick. For the, for the first six weeks of our series, we We're really kind of observing the life of Daniel through the book of Daniel as if we were kind of on a balcony looking at the street level view of of Daniel's life. Like we're observing some of these incredible moments. Daniel's resolve in chapter one, the interpretation of the dream in chapter two. You see Daniel kind of step aside and you see his friends uh, say, I'm willing to not worship anyone but God, even if it costs me going into the fiery furnace in chapter three. In chapter four, you see Daniel say a hard thing to a king who's gone mad with his arrogance and his pride. In chapter 5, he sees the writing on the wall and interprets it, even though it would lead to the downfall and destruction of the king that he's talking to. In chapter 6, he says, I'll pray, even if it means me going to the lion's den, just as I, as I always have because of who the Lord is and how, how I know him. And in chapter 7, there's a turn where we go from being on the balcony to on the street, and we kind of get into Daniel's life. It's almost as if we open up his personal prayer journal where he records these uh, visions that he has in the context of encounters with God that Daniel experiences. And and as I've looked back on the story of Daniel so far, I've thought to myself and I've said, self, what is it about Daniel's life? What is it about Daniel's belief? What is it about Daniel that that just forms this just deep faith and trust in God? If we're honest, we read the book of Daniel and And we've read it to this point, and there's actually something about the way that Daniel lives in relation to God that's incredibly compelling. I I read this story and just read it quickly, even the last several days, and just thought, I want to follow God like Daniel does. Uh, Now, I might be honest, and you might be honest and be like, we don't necessarily want the circumstance of exile in our life to squeeze that out of us. But you look at Daniel just on the ground and say... That faith, that resolve, that belief, that affection for God, what, what is it about Daniel that, that, that crafts that, that forms that? It's, it's Michael Scott looking at Toby in a different way in the office and saying, why are you the way that you are? Dan-? Like, why? Like, I want to know because I want to follow God the way that Daniel follows God. What is it about Daniel that makes him the way that he is? We're going to get an answer to that question in Daniel chapter 9. But the answer to that question isn't just in Daniel chapter 9. In fact, it's been across the the picture of Daniel's life on the street so far. If you were to read the first six chapters of Daniel quickly, something that would stand out, both in inference and explicit description, is that Daniel is a man of prayer. In chapter 2, it'll be up on the screen, when Nebuchadnezzar threatens to kill all the wise men, which would have included Daniel and his friends, the text says that Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, his companions, and he told them to, check this, seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery. He says, let's seek God together, let's pray. Death at his doorstep, and the first response of Daniel is to pray. It's his first response, and it's also his resolve practice. In Daniel chapter 1, the first, one of the first uh, descriptors of Daniel is that he was resolved. And we see that resolve again in Daniel 6 when this Darius, which, which is the, me- the meaning of Darius is mighty man. It's like Pharaoh in Egypt, Darius in, in the context here. He signs an edict prohibiting the nation from worshiping anyone but the king. And we see Daniel's resolve on display again. Verse 10 of chapter 6 on the screen, when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows open in his upper chamber towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and he prayed and gave thanks before his God as he has done previously. It's a resolved practice in two senses. First, in the face of death, Daniel still chooses to pray. Second, it's not a random act of defiance because this is what Daniel did. It was a resolved act of discipline. He turned his face towards the temple, towards the desolation of Jerusalem, towards where he understood God to dwell. He faces it. He kneels down because often the posture of our hearts follows the posture of our bodies. And he prays 
over and over as he had done previously. Prayer was Daniel's first response and his resolved practice. Prayer is at the core of who Daniel is. And there's just something about Daniel's belief in God that shaped the way that Daniel lived his life. And we see it here on display in chapter 9. You see, the majority of our text this morning in Daniel 9 is one of Daniel's prayers. As I was studying it these last few weeks, I was reminded of a quote that I read a few years ago by a woman named Nancy Mares in her book, Ordinary Times. And the quote reads like this, who one believes God to be is most accurately revealed, not in any creed, but in the way one speaks to God when no one else is listening. Our glimpse into what Daniel believes about God that shapes and forms his life does not come from a carefully crafted theological answer to a confusing question that Daniel has asked. It does not come from a statement of belief that Daniel wrote while he was in the exile. It does not come from a systematic theology that he inscribed while he was uh, leading in his region. As helpful as those three tools are, it is not where we see what Daniel believes about God. What we see about what Daniel believes about God, where we see his life of prayer that shaped his life on display is in this prayer that would have taken him about three minutes to pray. Daniel's prayer reveals Daniel's belief, which shaped Daniel's life. And Christian, before we hop into this, you've got to understand that what's true of Daniel is also true of us. Our life reveals our belief, and what we believe about God is most accurately understood in what we say to him when no one else is listening. I think there's a key idea that comes out of this text as we're looking at the life of Daniel, as we're looking at Daniel chapter 9, we're, that, that we can really pull from it and see it shape our own lives as well, regardless of kind of where we're at this morning. Um, and the, the idea is this, note takers, this is for you. Here's my one thought that I'm going to kind of hook everything onto. The main idea for this morning is this. It's very simple. Pray what you got. <laughs> Pray what you got. We're going to look at this prayer of Daniel, and we're going to see that Daniel, Daniel prays what he's got. Philip Yancey was once asked, uh, how do you learn to pray? And he says a, a simple but profound answer. He says, you learn to pray by praying. And as we come across Daniel at 85 to 90 years old, we come across a man who has learned how to pray by just praying what he's got. And we're going to see Daniel pray what he's got in, in four ways. There are four things that Daniel has, and there are four things that we have as well. I hope that was enough time to get to Daniel chapter, chapter 9. Um, the word doesn't do the work, then the work won't get done. So let's get into it. Chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. In the first year of Darius, a son of Asterius, whoa, I messed that one up. Okay. By the sin of Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years, according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet, that must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sack, sackcloth and ashes. Pray what you got. Here's the first thing that we've got. The first thing that we've got is God's word. God's word. Eleven years after the events of Daniel chapter 8, uh, Daniel opens up the book of Jeremiah to study it. Please don't miss the simplicity of this sentence before Daniel utters even a word in prayer. It's an 85 to 90 year old man devoting himself to the simple practices of Bible reading and prayer. Daniel opens up Jeremiah, he brings out the book of scripture, he studies it, and he prays what he's got in front of him. And it's from this study of God's word that the prayer emerges. This dream interpreting, king counseling, region leading Daniel in his eighth decade of life and following God has not matured beyond the simple practice of reading the Bible and praying. And he hasn't matured beyond it because nobody ever matures beyond the simple practice of Bible reading and praying. Daniel believes that God's word is reliable, so he opens it, he reads it, and he prays from it. I think there's two things that we can adopt in our own practice of prayer from this life of Daniel. First, look, verses 2 and 3. I perceived in the books, and I turned my face towards God. Uh, these, these phrases show us that this time that Daniel is spending is not spontaneous, it is not random, it is structured, it is disciplined, it is a settled time where Daniel says, I am going to turn my face towards the Lord, which interestingly is both literal and an idiom in the Hebrew. It's literal because he's facing where the Lord dwelled in, in their mind, the, the, the area, the desolate city of Jerusalem, the temple that had been destroyed. We saw that in chapter 
chapter 6. It's an idiom because in the Hebrew, this language is an expression of attention. In fact, your translation might have it like this, that I turned my attention to the Lord. By turning his attention from the Lord, Daniel is articulating and saying, I'm turning my attention for this period of time from everything else. I'm turning my attention from all the things that could distract me, from all the things I've got to do, from all the regional leadership things I've got to get done. I'm going to turn my attention from all of these other things and turn my attention towards the most important thing. Daniel is holding space in his day for undistracted and unhurried time in Scripture and in prayer. And maybe that's just where, like, we need to start. Where, where, where if you look at your life and you're like, man, I don't, I don't even know where to begin as it relates to prayer. Maybe, maybe it's just holding a, a little bit of space, maybe some short, some long, what you've got, you can pray from there. But, but to have a daily time where you're saying, I'm just going to have a bit of time where I'm undistracted and I'm unhurried and I'm turning my attention and my face towards God. That's what we see forming the life of Daniel. But maybe you're like me, and you have these moments where you, <laughs> you just, you're praying, and you, you just aren't sure at a certain point what to say anymore. I remember when I was a sophomore in college, um, one, of the, one of the first times, because there were a couple of times that I stutter started this, uh, where I was like, I want to be, like, I want to be, a, like, I had this phrase, I want to be a man of prayer. Like, that was this idea, this picture I had. I want to be about prayer. Like, I want to do that. I'd never really done that. I want to be someone who prays. And so I set my alarm an hour early which was just way too early, just it, for any period of time. But I set my alarm an hour early, specifically as a sophomore in college. Those minutes were precious. And um, I, I, just, I just remember um, waking up, snacking the alarm, getting on my face, uh, on my, my bed, knees on the floor, and praying. And I had these, like, th- I had a list that I'd written out of things. I was like, I'm going to pray about these things, da-da-da. And then I, <laughs> I look over my alarm clock, like, certainly, like, I am, I am about to have to get up, like, certainly this has been, I've been in inner seat. It was like six minutes. Like it was like, I, 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 I had run out of things. And I, I'll be honest with you, like what part of my story is that I really struggled with like performance. And I brought that into, in like being in like how I was seen. And I brought that into following Jesus with me when I started following Jesus before I began college. And, and I was like, oh God, like I let you down. I failed you. I felt so much shame about praying, which you shouldn't feel. Um, and I, I, I did. And I remember just opening my Bible and being like, well, I guess I'll just read the Bible. (laughs) Like that's some consolation prize. And I remember like just reading the Bible and having this moment while I was reading the Bible that was like, what if I just, what if I just prayed what I'm reading? (laughs) Like what if I just prayed what I'm, I always saw the Bible in prayer as these tangential things that touched at some point in the middle. I should quote scripture in prayer because it made me sound more holy or something. Um, But, but I never understood, just didn't click for me that this was an integrated thing. Bible reading and prayer was the inhale and the exhale of me spending my time with Jesus, that I could just read the scripture and pray what I was reading. I could pray as I was reading the scripture, that these two things could beautifully come together. And, and, And I learned this, that perhaps when I run out of things to say to God that I can just turn back to the things that God's already said to me and start there and from that place actually grow in my life of prayer. He's given me his word so I can just pray what I've got. That's where we see Daniel start to pray what he's got. He reads and he prays God's word. And as he continues, we see another thing shape Daniel's life of prayer. God's name. Verses four and five. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. Daniel prays God's word and he prays God's name because he's got God's word and he's got God's name. Hey, you got to hang on with me here for a second because this is inc- incredible, but we got to do a little bit of work. Verse 4 reads in English very differently than it would have felt in Hebrew. And that's because we read, O Lord, the great and awesome, or maybe your Bible says great and dreadful God. And we assume, understandably, that Lord and God are simply two titles that Daniel is using to address the one that he's praying to. And they're, they're not. One of these is a title, 
And it's the phrase, great and awesome God, Gadol Yare El. It's the great and awesome or the great and dreadful God. It's a title used to describe God uh, multiple times, that he is a powerful God. He's great. He's awesome. He's dreadful. We should approach him with seriousness and with reverence. And Daniel knows that God is powerful. This title signifies him. But the other word that Daniel uses, the word here that translates in, in our language to Lord, It's different. We hear Lord and we think Star Wars, like Lord Vader or whatever, like the newest masterpiece classic is. It's like Lord whatever of Downton Abbey or whatever it is. Um, And and we think with our our language and our scope that this is a title. Now in the Hebrew, the usage of Lord was used sometimes as a title. It was used for Adon or Adonai. Some some of your translations will have like different ways of how they try to signify that. And, And those are usually used in conjunction with people or with a different word. So it would be like, uh, Adonai Rapha, like the Lord that heals. Like it would be used for these names that would be, kind of, or the, these titles that would kind of be ascribed to God. But there's a usage of Lord where um, all the letters in the Lord are capitalized typically. And this word is not Adon or Adonai. The word used there is Yahweh. And the word that begins Daniel's prayer here is not simply a title signifying that God is powerful. It's a name signifying that God's relationship with Daniel and Daniel's relationship with God is personal. Daniel refers to God by his name. In this period of time, and still in some Eastern contexts and, and even in the West, the name was described to, uh, provided to describe who a person was. Uh, Michael Knowles, a, an academic in the field of the Old Testament study, says it like this. Uh, in, in a word, in the world of Hebrew scriptures, a person's name was often thought to indicate something essential about the bearer's identity. Uh, another way to say that is that someone's name revealed their nature. By starting with the name of God, Daniel is praying what several men and women in his time period were too afraid to utter aloud because they, they, want, they were like, he's so powerful, but is he personal? But by starting with the name of God, Daniel is addressing God not only as powerful, but as personal, not one or the other, but both. And as he does so, it's being communicated to us that Daniel knows who he's talking to because he's referring to him by name and his name is his nature. So as he's referring to God by name, he's saying, God, I know who you are, and I know what you're like. In Exodus 34, God gives his name to Moses in a portion of scripture that's most quoted internally to the scripture, Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7, uh, and the description is this. He says, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, maintaining love to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but who by no means will clear the guilty, because he's just. And, and it, that name the Lord, Yahweh, is described in those portions of who he is and what he's like, his nature. And that's how Daniel is approaching God. Daniel has come to know God's name. So when Daniel's praying to God, he's praying to a God that he knows is powerful, but he also knows is chosen to be relational and will consistently be uh, in accord with his nature. So he says, I'm praying to the Lord who is compassionate and merciful. God, I know that you're that. I know that you're slow to anger. I know that you're abounding in steadfast love. I know that you maintain love. I know that you forgive. I know that you're just because I know who you are. And it's so obvious through the rest of this prayer that Daniel knows the God that he is speaking to. He knows the God that he's talking with because he knows his name. And he knows his nature. So Daniel, throughout this prayer, will confess God as merciful and good and gracious throughout the prayer because he knows that God is these things. And before I, I move on from this, I just... We can hear that and think, I don't know God the same way that Daniel knew God. And I need you to understand that Daniel didn't just pop up one day at 85 to 90 years old with some sudden knowledge and familiarity with the name and nature of God. From the time that he was a boy, he had grown more and more and more in his knowledge over time and his experience with God over time. We're meeting someone here who has walked with God for decades 
And over those decades, Daniel has become progressively more and more and more aware and knowledgeable and experiential and familiar with the God who is powerful and personal. He's read the books and he's prayed over and over and over. He's walked with God and he's come to grow in his understanding of who God is. So I need you to hear this. You don't have to pray what Daniel's got because you don't have what Daniel had. Daniel has an understanding of God that is different than yours and different than yours and different than ours because each of us have these different experiences with God, but he goes back to the book and he goes back to the name because he knows that that's where he is coming to understand more and more of the God that he is praying to, more and more who he is. So you just need to pray what you've got. You need to pray based on the understanding that you're ascertaining in, that you're growing in as you come to know this God more and more and more. You just pray what you got. You can start there. Maybe you need to just stare Exodus 34 verses 6 and 7 in the face for a little bit and say, God, that's what you're like, and that's, who I'm gonna, that's how I'm going to understand you as I'm praying to you. So pray what you got. God's word, God's name, and now Daniel shifts from looking up to God to looking in at himself. I'm going to read a lot of scripture here uh, to really fill in the prayer, and I want you to just pay attention. I've got to kind of emphasize on the screen up here to what Daniel emphasizes across the majority of this prayer. Verse 4. I prayed to the Lord my God, and I made my confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keeps his commandments, we have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. You, O Lord, to you belongs righteousness, but to us open shame. As at this day, the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, those who are near and those who are far away, and all the lands to which you have driven them, because of the treachery they have committed against you. To us, O Lord, belongs open shame. To our kings, to our princes, our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belongs mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed or broken your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And the curse and oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. He has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us. And against our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us a great calamity. For under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like what has been done against Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us. Yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insights by your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept ready the calamity and has brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works that he has done, and we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself, as at this day we have sinned and we have done wickedly. Pretty intense prayer. He's got sackcloth and ashes on him, and he's fasting because he's mourning for the sin that has been committed in his mind by him and by his people. And it's evident in this prayer that Daniel knows who he's praying to. You saw it all over that text. All of those descriptors, God's name, his nature, laid and, and all the way through it. And at the same time, Daniel knows who he is as well. And Daniel knows what his people have done. Something that clearly rings in the mind and the words of Daniel is that he and his people have sinned. They've rebelled against God. They've not followed him. They've not listened to him. They've not returned to him. So what does Daniel do? Daniel prays what he's got. After opening the word and contemplating the name of God, he looks at himself, he looks at his people, and he prays his confession. It's the third movement of praying what we got. We have God's word, God's name, and our confession. Daniel confesses his sin, and this confession of sin reveals something absolutely incredible that Daniel believed, and I think that shaped and formed his life greatly. Daniel believed that God welcomed confession. If you remember, I just read it, but Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7, specifically in verse 7, the text says that God is uh, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. Now what 
what can be really glossed over and really missed there is that it doesn't say God forgives iniquity, rebellion, and sin. It says that he is forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. It's as if God is saying, hey, you need to understand, forgiveness is not some extra thing that I do out here, some activity that I'm just like responsive to, sometimes external to the character that I've communicated to you. I need you to know that forgiveness is a part of who I am. I'm forgiving in my nature. That's what God is saying. It's not some activity. It's a part of his identity. And that's because God is a relational God who Daniel has come to know and Daniel is praying to. And he says, I'm in relationship with you. And God says, I'm going to be in relationship with you. And because I'm going to be in relationship with people, I'm going to be forgiving because the only people that I can be in relationship with are people who need forgiveness. The only people that God could be in a relationship with are people who need to confess because the only people that there are are people who need to confess. The only people that there are are people who need his forgiveness. And it is so evident in Daniel's prayer that he believes that that's a part of the nature of God and that he believes that God welcomes his confession. He so fully believes it that almost every other line of this prayer is a confession of sin. Daniel just prays what he's got. He's got his confession. Two things to note here about Daniel's confession that I think could shape our prayer and our own confession. First, Daniel prays an unexcused confession. How many excuses did Daniel make for himself and for his people across the entirety of that prayer? How many times did he say, God, it's, it's not what we're really like, though. God, I, I only did it one, we only did it one time, But God, it didn't really hurt anybody. Oh, God, I'll never do it again. I stumble because I've prayed prayers where I've made those excuses in confession to God. Where we feel this need to try to come to him better than we actually are as if he's not really forgiving or as if we need to convince him that he needs to be forgiving towards us or we need to convince him that he somehow needs to welcome our confessions. We need to try to set ourselves apart. We need to try to make some promise to God that we're surely likely not to keep. Instead of understanding that God is forgiving in his nature and that he welcomes our confession Daniel makes a confession without excuse. He confesses the sin of himself and the sin of his people, and he doesn't hide, and the only alternative to not hiding is refusing to hide. Daniel refuses to hide any of his sin because he's convinced based on the nature of God that the God he is praying to welcomes his confession because the God he is praying to is forgiving in his nature. This is a terrifying insistence made clear in the prayer that fully exposes himself and the nation to God. And he's willing to fully expose himself, fully confess, without excuse, because he believes that God welcomes his confession. The other thing that we see Daniel do here is give an unedited confession. It is a gut-wrenching degree of honesty that that Daniel's prayer should challenge in us. And when we look at God and we look at ourselves, because one of the easiest things for us to do in prayer is to hide behind an edited prayer. You see, Daniel is praying out of the emotion and the weight and the breadth and the heaviness of the circumstance that he's in. He is mourning, he is fasting, he is lamenting, he is praying with great emotion because he understands the circumstance around him is incredibly broken. In exile, Jerusalem is desolate, but God, I know that you promised this. What I'm seeing in your word is not what I'm experiencing in my life. God, help me. Anybody ever experienced that before? That's Daniel. That's this moment. And it is an unedited confession of his brokenness before God because it is an unedited confession of how he is feeling in the midst of the circumstance that he's in. And it is so easy for us to hide behind edited prayers that are always happy, clappy, boilerplate, Christianity language and never get into the areas of our life that need the healing of God, never expose the areas of our life where we really want him to move, the sins that we commit, that we want him to forgive, the emotions that we feel that we don't know what to do with the pain that we experience that we're not sure that he can actually do anything with. We pray edited prayers that include these incredibly real things perhaps because we've stopped or paused in believing that God actually wants to do anything about it. Yet Daniel seems sure that God wants to do something about it. 
Perhaps because we have a picture of God that does not align with how he describes himself. We have a picture of God that says, I've got to clean myself up before I bring any of myself towards you. But he's forgiving in his nature. So he knows that we're going to come needing him and needing his forgiveness. I have so much respect for the men and women who have invited me and the women, men and women who have allowed me to be invited into their life to pray unedited prayers. Prayers that expose deep struggle and deep doubt, deep desires, deep struggles. Prayers of people simply asking them to hold on to them today. The unedited nature of a prayer before God that we are coming to know. Just praying what we got out of the depths of circumstance and the need of confession. Now the opposite of confession is concealing. Concealing is the act of keeping our sin tucked away, keeping our sin secret. But the problem is that who you are in secret, Doc says, is who you really are. When we try to present ourselves like we're something that we're not, when we try to present ourselves as better than we are, we choose lives marked by pain and confusion and tension and burden. When we conceal our sin, we refuse to confess to God and others. We are simultaneously saying a few things. We're simultaneously looking to God and saying, I can manage my sin better than you can. We look at the cross and say, nice try, Jesus. I'll take it from here. And we look at ourselves and think that we're far better than we actually are. When we conceal our sin, we say no to the freedom that God offers by being a forgiving God. God does not punish confession. He welcomes it. He welcomes it because it leads to forgiveness. It leads to freedom, and it leads to fresh relationship with him. Daniel's belief in this is rock solid, and it's revealed in his prayer. God welcomes confession. So what do we do? We pray what we got. We just pray our confession. God's word, God's name, God's confession, and finally, I'm sorry, God's word, God's name, his confession, and finally, his request. When we pray what we've got, we're going to pray our request. Daniel 9, verses 15 through 19. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and have made a name for yourself, as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O, O Lord, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy hill, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all the people who are around us. Now, therefore, O our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and his pleas for mercy. And for your own sake, Lord, make your face to shine upon the sanctuary which is desolate. O my God, incline your ear and hear, open your eyes and see our desolation, the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas to you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. Lord, hear. Lord, forgive. Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. Daniel begins his request by remembering in prayer when God delivered his people from Egypt. It is a common repetition of remembrance throughout the Old Testament. Daniel is essentially praying his circumstance again, and he's saying, God, you see where we are. We are in exile. We're being traded from kingdom to kingdom. We look at the city, and we see that it's desolate. But God, I look back, and I see that you delivered us from Egypt before. So God, would you please just do it again? Like, that's the desperation of Daniel's prayer. He's saying, God, I've seen you before. Can you please just do it again? And Daniel asks over and over in this prayer, according to God's righteousness, his name, his mercy for his glory, Daniel is praying what he's got because he's convinced that God hears his request. And at the heart of Daniel's request is this, God, restore your people, restore Jerusalem, restore the temple, restore the people, restore the place, restore worship of your name. Daniel is asking for restoration. It is a bold, honest, and massive prayer staring impossibility down in the face and saying, God, for the sake of your name, will you do the impossible and bring restoration? It is honest, it is simple, it is desperate, and it's what Daniel's got. God, you want to know what I want more than anything? Bring the restoration that you promised. That's what Daniel's saying. What's interesting is that Daniel notes that he isn't praying and expecting God to do something because of how righteous or good Daniel or the people are, because they aren't. (laughs) Daniel's just spent the last two paragraphs of his prayer confessing their sin. Look at verse 18. I love this verse. For we do not present our pleas according to our righteousness, but according to your great mercy. Daniel knows that God is merciful 
His mercy is in his nature. He's merciful to forgive. He's read the mercy in the book. So Daniel's convinced that God will be merciful to hear Daniel's request. So Daniel just prays what he's got. God's word, God's name, our confession, our request. What we pray will reveal what we believe. What we believe will form what we pray. Daniel's prayer reveals these beliefs. These beliefs form his prayer. And so Daniel just prays what he's got. So two simple charges for the room before I step into the final movement of Daniel chapter 9. Two groups of people. One group of people in the room need to hear these two words. I need you to hear when it relates to you in in, in prayer. I need you to hear, please hear this, keep going. (laughs) I realized a little while ago that all of the men and women that I look up to as heroes in my life fast and pray. It was the consistent thing that I saw in all of their lives, in so many of their lives, and some of them are actually in the room this morning. And I just want to say to you who are praying in, in, in this moment, who are praying uh, in your life, who have a practice of prayer in the life of Doxa Church, I just want to say to you, please keep going. I thank God for you who pray. Please keep going. Keep praying the word. Keep praying his name. Keep praying your confession and our confession. Please keep praying your request. Keep going. And for some of you who have felt the slight shame whenever we talk about prayer or spiritual formation that you're perhaps not practicing, I want you to hear the words, don't wait. Please don't wait to start a practice of prayer. The right time to start is right now. You can master the reset, walk out of these rooms and just pray what you've got with the time that you've got, whatever that looks like, just his word, his name, your confession, your request. If you look at yourself and you're like, Rudy, I don't know much about the Bible. I don't know much about God's name. I don't really know how to do this yet. Here's what I'll say to you. Just pray what you got. Just pray what you've got. Just start somewhere. Don't wait and just pray what you've got. So this week we're going to do just that. We're going to pray right here at Doxa. We'll pray from Scripture because we believe that God's Word is reliable. We'll pray in the name of Jesus because we believe that God's name is His nature. We'll take time to confess our sin because God welcomes our confession. We will ask greatly of God for this city, for this church, for the church plants and overseas partners, for the ministries here, for the local missions ministries, and for the requests of men and women in this church because we believe that God hears our requests. Ultimately, we're going to gather this week and just pray what we've got. Please come pray what you've got. I need to pray what I've got because I'm not Daniel, which is obvious. Um, But what I mean to say is that I'm not here yet. I read the story of Daniel's life and I'm challenged by his boldness. I'm challenged by his clarity, by his passion, by his resolve, by his intimacy with God. I'm challenged by his life because I see the gap between my life and his. But I want to follow God like Daniel did. I want to believe as Daniel did about God. And I think that several of us do as well. And what if the first step to that begins by just praying like Daniel prayed? What if our formation to be more like Daniel came from us continuing or starting to be formed deeply in prayer? What if today a step towards being like Daniel at 85 said we're just going to pray what we've got? I think that's our invitation. But that's not the end of the chapter. So I want to wrap that section and take a shift into Daniel's prayer and into God's response. And I'm going to end this by taking communion together. So if you've got your your little cup, you you can pull it out. You'll hold on to it for a little while, but, but we'll get there. What's incredible about these closing verses is what's so clear in it, and it's that Daniel prays and God answers. Verse 20, while I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, who I seen in the vision at first, came to me in swift flight in the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me understand, speaking with me and saying, Oh, Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to and atone for iniquity, and to bring everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. Know, therefore, and understand from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of the anointed one, a prince. There shall be seven weeks, and then for sixty-two weeks it shall be built again with squares and with a moat, but in a troubled time. 
And after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the prince, people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and there shall be made war. Desolations are decreed. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week he will put an end to the sacrifice and offering. And on the wings of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. All right, let's pray. That's pretty clear. Um, no, I'm kidding. Guys. Um, there's a ton in this section. To be honest, it would make your head spin how many views there are on these last few verses. You've got to wrestle with a few questions. Um, is time, as it's laid out here, literal, symbolic, or a combination? Are these events fulfilled or unfulfilled? Are the time periods, 7, 62, and 1, linked, separate, or a combination? Is it leading to a final moment or a foreshadowing of the final? I'm going to try to keep us above the fray as best I can. We can get coffee sometime and just hash it out. It'd be fun. Um, here's what we know. Daniel prays and God answers. What cannot be questioned as we dig into a moment like this is that Daniel asks for restoration, and through this answer to prayer, God is saying, I will bring restoration, and then gives a prophetic picture of what that restoration will look like, which points to Jesus Christ, the coming anointed one, Messiah and Savior that Daniel was looking, back, looking towards and that we look back on who has saved us from his sin if we have put our faith and trust in him. This is the landing point for these verses. Almost every major perspective of interpretation of this passage lands here, albeit in different ways. And as for how we get there in the text, I want to give you my, Rudy Hartman's, I passed this by the elders, I've got approval to share it, but this is my best shot at grasping what's being said here. I reserve the right to change my mind by noon today. Um, on the particulars, at least, but I want to show you how, how I, I got here. And I'm going to do what my math teacher, Mr. Mendoza, taught me to do and show my work. All right. Um, first, this 70 weeks thing needs to be dealt with because that seems like a fairly short time if we take weeks to be a literal seven-day period in this text. So just so you understand, the word weeks here in the Hebrew is Shabuah. Uh, it's a term used to uh, indicate a demarcation of seven of anything. It's kind of like how we use a dozen to describe 12 of something. It was a, a demarcation of a heptad or, or seven, a denomination, a group, or a set of seven uh, of, of anything. Um, now what's important to, to note is that we'll start chapter 10 next week, and you'll say, oh, here's the word weeks again. That clearly means seven of something, but that is Shabuah Yom, which means seven days. So there's a, there's a modifier to weeks as it appears in chapter 10, and there is no modifier as it appears in chapter 9. So most scholars agree here in the context of these seven weeks um, that these are 70 sets of seven years, kind of going back to the beginning of Daniel chapter 9. So these 70 sets of seven years, which would be 490 years, are broken down into three chunks. Look at verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there will be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks, connector word, it shall be built again with squares in a moat, but in a troubled time. So between the word going out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem and the coming of the anointed one, there's seven sets of seven years and 62 sets of seven years, 483 years. Here's what I'm going to dive into my understanding, just an angle to come at it. Okay, so um, in Ezra, there's this laying out of the going out of the word as a decree is given by Artaxerxes in the seventh year of his reign, per Ezra 7. The historians Herodias and Theocleides place his reign in Persia from 465 to 424 BC. The seventh year there would be four. Uh, 58 BC. So 300, 483 years after that would be approximately 26 AD, right around either, depending on when you see Jesus being born in six, uh, between 6 and 4 AD, which is where most scholars land. Uh, that's going to land either uh, 26 AD, the end of this time period, approximately at Jesus' baptism or his entry into Jerusalem before he is crucified. Ah, so here's the, the layout from here. After this, what comes is that the anointed one is cut off with the crucifixion of Jesus. And after his crucifixion in AD 70, the city and the temple of Jerusalem are leveled and destroyed. In our English translation, what comes next is a new sentence. And it's here because of the grammatical demarcation that sometimes indicates a break in the Hebrew. Um, and, in, uh, and there's also a, a verbal clause used here for a future tense piece that it shall come, it shall come, it shall come. So I read this to mean that there's a break. 
between the end of the 69 years and the final week, representing the desolation and eventual destruction of the foreshadowed Antichrist that we've been talking about in chapter 7 and chapter 8, and the return of Jesus Christ to restore all things. And that's about as far as I feel comfortable communicating my interpretation in this context about such a confounded passage. I'm not worried if you land with me on that or not. I just wanted to do what my math teacher said and show my work. Here's what I know. It's true. Daniel prays and God answers. Daniel asks for restoration and God promises that he will. And he says there will be a point at which the Messiah, the anointed one, the Savior comes. He will come, but he will be cut off. He'll be crucified. He'll be killed for the sin of the world that he's come to restore, to put to an end. And that one day Christ will return. He'll put an end to injustice, wickedness, evil sin, and the personification of all these things, which is the Antichrist. Desolation will be destroyed by Jesus Christ. He'll return and he'll make all things new. The decreed end will come and Christ will rule and reign forever and he will bring Bring to those who trust in him everlasting righteousness. That's what I read at the end of this text. And so we find ourselves between the resurrection of Jesus and this decreed time of his return. So what do we do as we wait for that decreed time? What do we do as we wait for the return of Jesus? Well, in chapter 7, Nate taught us to endure. In chapter 8, Rob taught us to trust. And in chapter 9, Daniel's modeling for us what we should do as we wait like he did. At least one thing we should do while we wait is pray. We follow the example that Daniel lays out in the text and we pray what we've got. We don't have to wait for eternity to have relationship with God because it's offered to us now. Christ has made it, Christian, so that you can be and have life with him now. And prayer is a practice of resting in relationship with a God who has chosen to be personal and who has chosen to save you. He's given you his word and his name and he welcomes your confession and your request so you can pray what you got. So we pray. And then the other thing that we need to do is remember. So you can take out your communion cups, and we're going to do that together. We're going to do what has been done in the words of Jesus where he said on the night that he was prayed to remember him. We're going to remember this Jesus who's put an end to all sin, this Jesus who is going to bring righteousness, who's done what is necessary and has done what is required. We're going to remember Christian, as you take the wafer and you hold it as a representation of the body of Jesus Christ, that this body was broken to put an end to all sin. This body was broken, God's body in Christ, broken for you so that your body might not, might not be broken for the sin. That you, we can come and bring our confession and know that he'll be forgiving because he has said that his nature is forgiving and he exemplified that forgiving nature on the cross when Jesus Christ put the sin of the world on his shoulders and lifted it off of ours. So we, we take the body together, remembering that body that was broken. You may go ahead, Christian, and do it now. What do I even say about the blood? Jesus, what do I even say about the blood? We take this cup in remembrance of the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for us, that cleanses our sin, that puts an end to sin, that atones for us. Our assurance of eternal righteousness, not in my blood shed, not in my effort, not and anything that I've done or anything we could do, but only in Christ and only in what he has done. So we remember Jesus, the blood that was shed. We confess our sin. You told us to before we did this, so we confess. We confess our unforgiveness. We confess our, our lust. We confess our anger. We confess our betrayal. We confess our iniquity, our rebellion, and our sin. You welcome our confession, Jesus. You've forgiven it for all who have put their trust in you. You died on the cross, shed your blood, and you rose three days later so that we might know that all that we've confessed, past, present, and future is forgiven. 
and that the new life that we have is not in our own effort, but is in what you and you alone have done. So we take and we remember. Jesus, we do this in remembrance of you. We want to pray what we've got as we wait for your return. God, help us to love your word. Help us to love and know your name. Help us, God, free us to bring our confession to you. Free us to bring our requests. God, and even now in this moment, would we bring our worship? Would we minister to you? God, would the way that we sing bless your name, that it would just be a pleasant aroma rising up from 2,700 novation, God, that you would delight in our worship even here and even now as we remember and rejoice in you, our God. It's in your name. Amen.